In this video, I'm going to be walking you through my approach to the different types of causes of tachycardia. And we're going to be walking through this simple algorithm right here. And it's really broken down into narrow versus wide complex tachycardia and then regular versus irregular. So the very first branch point that we're going to be making for tachycardia is going to be uh, narrow versus wide. And what we're dealing with when we're talking about narrow and wide is the QRS. So anything less than 0.12 is going to be narrow. Anything greater than 0.12 is going to be wide. After the narrow versus wide, it's going to be broken down into regular and irregular uh, narrow complex tachycardia. And when we're dealing with regular, the most common ones that we're thinking about is AVNRT, AVRT, as well as atrial flutter. The one point that I wanted to make is that a lot of times people ask you, what's the most common cause of regular? regular narrow complex tachycardia and people oftentimes bring up another answer any of these AVNRT or atrial flutter but really the most common one you can never forget about it is sinus tachycardia is your most common form of tachycardia as well as your most common narrow regular complex tachycardia so it's just kind of like a trick question that a lot of people like to ask you because you forget about that as being your regular narrow complex. So the example that I'm going to use is sinus tachycardia as well as atrial flutter. You see our QRSs are narrow, which uh, less than 0.12 seconds is going to be uh, anything three small boxes or less, and it's going to be very regular. The distance between each of the QRSs is going to be all the same value. And then our atrial flutter example, we see our sawtooth pattern. QRSs are also going to be narrow, and when we march out the QRSs, uh, they're all going to be regular. The next one is going to be irregular narrow complex tachycardia. And when we're dealing with this, it's most commonly it's going to be AFib is the one that you commonly are going to recognize, but also multifocal tachycardia. So irregular narrow complex tachycardia, this is going to be AFib. Our QRS is going to be narrow, and um, the, it's also going to be an irregular uh, waveform. So when we're dealing with wide complex tachycardia, it's, it's a little bit more difficult. They're oftentimes, these are ones that you probably haven't seen at all or, or very infrequently. So I'll touch on them very briefly. I want you to just be familiar with them, but not necessarily be able to identify them per se. So wide complex uh, tachycardia is also broken down into regular as well as irregular. And the most common one that you're going to be remembering is going to be your VTAC, but also SVT with a bundle branch block. And for VTAC, when we're dealing with VTAC, uh, we see that the QRS is going to be wide um, and then it's, it's still going to be regular. So every QRS is going to be regular distance between one another. When we're dealing with irregular wide complex tachycardia, these are things that probably you definitely haven't seen. AFib with bundle branch block, polymorphic VT, as well as a pre-excited um, AFib. The one reason why I didn't go into a great deal of showing you every single type of waveform is because what I think is more important is being able to identify is it narrow or is it wide and is it regular or irregular. And the reason why that's important is because the treatment oftentimes um, is kind of categorized in that way. So every type of regular narrow complex tachycardia that are stable, the treatment that we likely are going to be giving them is going to be adenosine. And when we're dealing with any type of irregular narrow complex tachycardia, the likely treatment is going to be some type of rate control. So these are things like beta blockers or calcium channel blockers. So it makes our life a lot easier. So once we can identify it's narrow and then we can identify is it regular or irregular, the treatment is oftentimes going to be the same within these large categories. So being able to tell the difference between AVNRT and AVRT and all of these different uh, waveforms, at least if you cannot do that, at least you have a treatment that you can think of if somebody were to ask you. The, for wide complex tachycardia, it's a lot it's more complicated in my opinion. When we're dealing with these, we're starting to think about antiarrhythmics, and there's a variety of antiarrhythmics that we can use. We'll kind of talk about that in a second. So why complex tachycardia is more when we're starting to think about uh, antiarrhythmics and kind of bringing on cardiology for consultation much sooner. Narrow complex tachycardia, we like to think about adenosine and rate control. For more educational resources like our HP notebooks, check out medicalbasics.com. What I think is also important is being able to think about that algorithm that I gave you, but kind of pairing it down into this ACLS algorithm, because this is what you're going to be seeing more often is the ACLS algorithm. So kind of I'll walk you through it. What they broke it down into, is it wide or is it narrow? So we'll take the narrow example first. So it's not wide, so it's going to be narrow. Um, and then we're going to be walking through vagal maneuvers and then adenosine if it's regular, like we mentioned, and then any type of rate control, like a beta blocker or calcium channel blocker. And these are all if they're stable. 
And then if we start thinking about a wide complex tachycardia, we're going to be giving some type of antiarrhythmic. And these are going to be things like amiodarone, sotalol, procanamide. Each individual type of wide complex uh, tachycardia is going to have a different um, antiarrhythmic that's going to be more preferential. Um, so that's, this is definitely when we start thinking about more of a, a cardiology consult much sooner. Um, and then you can consider adenosine only if it's regular as well as monomorphic. So these are all patients that are on the stable spectrum, but if they're unstable, what do you do? So this is persistent tachycardia causing any of these things that you would deem somebody as being unstable, hypotension, altered mental status, shock, things like that. What you're going to be dealing with is cardioversion. So you're going to be giving cardioversion regardless if they're going to be unstable. So regardless if it's narrow or wide, we'll always remember that cardioversion is when you're dealing with unstable patients and you're going to be giving some type of medical management when you're dealing with stable patients. So hopefully this algorithm and walking through the ACL algorithm will be helpful and just kind of know the general treatments and then it'll be a much easier time in kind of identifying them. Be sure to check out our website medicalbasics.com for more educational resources like our progress notebook and don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more tips and lessons.